Welcome into the Boys Collective episode number 34 right here on 105 Through the Fan on YouTube. My name is Kevin Gray alongside Super Bowl winning scout and one fourth of the G Bag Nation, Brian Broaddus. Brian, good and happy Wednesday to you. Good to see you. How are we feeling today? Well, KG, you know, man, these days are flying by as we get towards the end of this uh, football season, but so much still to play for and talk about. So always look forward to being with you on a day like this. Dallas Cowboys in preparations at 11 and four, getting ready to welcome in the Arizona Cardinals on Sunday afternoon. Still a lot to play for for a Cowboys team uh, that comes off of a terrific win over the Washington football team now set their sights to try and do what they can to be in the best position to try and capitalize on becoming the number one seed if the Packers uh, falter in the next couple of weeks. You can find Brian on Twitter at Brian Broaddus. You can find me on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. Be sure to hit that subscribe button right there for 105 Through the Fan here on YouTube. And, of course, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 105 Through the Fan and, of course, on 105 Through the Fan.com. We would be remiss if we did not spend a couple of minutes on the untimely passing of John Madden. John Madden passing away at the age of 85 on Tuesday morning and the news coming out Tuesday evening that he had passed away at the age of 85. Jerry Jones in a statement that he put out said in part, if you knew John, he made your life better. For me, he was a trusted, confident advisor and teacher. And above all, a very dear friend. When he walked into the room, it was a better day. When he when he talked, you listened and you learned. When he laughed, everyone in the room laughed. And when he got back onto the bus, you always wanted more. You were always looking forward to his next visit. He goes on to end his statement. Quote, a life in football is a gift and, and a blessing. John lived all of his days with dignity, kindness, and a sense of personal caring for everything and everyone. There is no one who lived a more beautiful football life than John Madden. That is a statement in part from Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones. And obviously, John Madden, a pop culture icon with the Madden video game, his time as a broadcaster working for all four major uh, networks, being ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, but also the winningest coach by win percentage in the National Football League, winning Super Bowl XI over the Minnesota Vikings. Brian, your thoughts on the legend that was John Madden and the impact that he had on the game of football and what he meant to you and your career as far as the football journey that you've been on yourself is concerned. Yeah, and uh, I have very, very fond memories of John Madden from my early days working in Green Bay. And uh, my boss at the time was Ron Wolf, the Hall of Fame general manager, and he had been with John Madden for you know, all of John's career with the Raiders and stuff like that. And, and to me, you know, it was, it was so neat to be at Lambeau field and see that Madden cruiser be in the parking lot and know that you were going to have a lot of fun that day visiting with John Madden and, you know, with him and Ron Wolf would get together in a room. We would just all scouts just sit there and they would tell story after story after story and you just were amazed of, you know, the, the football history and that and those two gentlemen's brains and how they were able to talk about it in a way and then have fun doing it. And John Madden truly, you know, he made everybody feel special. You know, if, you know, I, I was a it was, you know, just a, a lowly scout, you know, but man, when we we got to hang out with Madden. He made us all feel like we were the most important things ever. You know, we were the reason why the Packers were winning. And, you know, he just had that kind of personality. You know, and you go and you visit, like I say, you get on the bus. He was so excited to take us on a tour of the bus. And, hey, this is this is how I watch film. And this is my film setup. And this is how I watch games. And as a scout, you're kind of like going, man, you're thinking, how cool would it be to have a bus like this and travel from school to school and be able to do film and work and stuff? But John Madden just always made everybody in the room feel special. Like I say, just a lowly scout like me, uh, just, you know, he, he was so nice. Uh, Jerry's right about the laugh and how infectious he was in that way. He made everybody's day really, really special. And uh, it's a difficult time. 
you know, but those are, those are the types of guys when you get to work in the NFL, you're around pillars of the national football league and guys that grew the game to the point where it is today, where it's one of the most popular games worldwide. And so, uh, you know, I'll always remember the very, very happy times with him. Uh, I'll always remember the, the, uh, the times when he named us to his all Madden team as a scouting staff in 96, he gave us sweatshirts. He thanked each one of us for what we do. And that's always special. And I, uh, I hold very fond memories of him and, and what he meant to this game. John Madden went 103, 32 and seven in his career, a 759 winning percentage, the highest yeah. winning percentage in the national football league. He, you know, KG real quick. And I know I don't ever do anything quick, but he he was coaching in an era where you had some legendary teams also playing at that time, or he would have had more Super Bowls. I think he was in five AFC championship games. And you look at the, the matchups he had with the, the Miami Dolphins of the early 70s, uh, you know, the late 60s were the Kansas City Chiefs, the early 70s were the Dolphins. Then came the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know, we've seen so many games and – you know, if you look at football history with Madden, it's a lot of them are things that we've always like we look at the NFL films and the names, the iconic games, the sea of hands, the holy roller goes to the post, the immaculate reception. Every one of those games were a Raider John Madden led, led game. And that just shows you how many games, not only, you know, as a coach and I, I mean, guys my, my age know him as a coach. Uh, younger people know him probably more for his video games. And if you're kind of in between, you know him as the broadcaster and stuff. So, uh, but yeah, he, he was a part of just so many iconic games, but his career, as good as it was, as really as great as it was, he was overlapped by the Dolphins, the Steelers, and a really good Kansas City Chief team in the late 60s. And it's interesting. I'm kind of one of the ones that fall in between because – I'm 35 years old, so right. being able to watch and listen to Pat Summerall and John Matten during the heyday of the Cowboys and their success, he was the soundtrack of my early football life. And right. watching those games between the Packers and the Cowboys and the 49ers, the countless NFC championship games and all the great moments that the Cowboys participated in with Pat Summerall and John Madden on the call Thanksgiving day games. Remember sitting down with my dad and watching, you know, countless Thanksgiving day games and Pat Summerall and John Madden doing their thing and just listening and enjoying them. And then transitioning to the pop culture icon that he became with the commercials and the, all the things with the Madden video game, he transcended football. And I said it earlier, you know, you cannot tell the story of the National Football League without John Madden permeating through multiple decades of the National Football League in its growth. So he will be on the Mount Rushmore, if you will, of influencers of the National Football League uh, as folks continue to remember him and the influence that he had on this game. We wanted to make sure that we spent a couple of times on John Madden, given the influence that he's had. Uh, on the game of the National Football League. Uh, speaking of influence, Jerry Jones, of course, has tremendous influence in today's modern NFL. And his Cowboys right now are 11 and four, currently the number two seed in the NFC playoffs right now. They are in the middle of preparations to take on the Arizona Cardinals right now, who find themselves losers of three straight, not playing the best of football right now. But the last time, the Arizona Cardinals came to AT&T Stadium back on October 19, 2020 on a Monday night. They dropped 38 points on the Dallas Cowboys in an embarrassing performance, 38 to 10. The Cowboys lost on that night. Let's start, though, here, because I think this is an interesting question for a lot of folks who are watching this team and have seen the growth, not only offensively and defensively, because we'll get to Kellen Moore and, and Dan Quinn here in a second. How much credit, Brian, does Mike McCarthy deserve for this NFC East championship and what this team has been able to achieve up to this point, knowing that they still have a lot in front of them, given the expectations coming into this year and now where they sit with just two weeks left in the season now? Yeah, it's funny you say this, KG, because one of my dear friends overseas that I talk to daily, whether on the phone or through text, his He's on me about this. He's on me about Mike McCarthy, and he keeps telling me that he's the best coach. And, 
you know, and they're, they're, they're going to do this and do that. And, you know, it, it's, there's people that have come at me and said, hey, listen, you have no credibility if you get on Mike McCarthy. Well, I, I, I'm willing to give Mike McCarthy credit for what they did. I, I'm, I'm willing to give Mike McCarthy credit for um, the fact that, you know, that they were able to turn things around, that they had a better understanding of, uh, you know, what they needed to do to teach uh, during, say, pandemics, uh, you know, how to handle meetings, you know, this overall, they've, you know, the coaching staff that he initially hired was not good enough. And you could say, well, there was no Dak Prescott and no this, no that. But, you know, there are coaches that lose players that, you know, for example, Dan Quinn has played without his best players the majority of the season. The defense found a way to get better throughout. Again, I'm not trying to slam Mike McCarthy because I'm willing to give him credit. You know, I, I do believe the football gods smiled on him by hiring Dan Quinn and then allowing Dan Quinn to bring coaches along with him when everybody could have said, well, Dan Quinn's a 500 coach. His defenses are outdated. You know, why bring these guys? in? I mean, there's a lot of people that didn't want that to even happen. You know, but Mike McCarthy, uh, you know, the Jones family, Will McClay, you know, to get an opportunity, you, you got to hire the right guys. And again, I think the football gods were very, very, you know, smiling on the Cowboys in this way, you know, because it, they could have. They could have just very simply hired George Edwards, and that probably would have been a pretty good hire. You know, and George is a really, really good coach, but they went outside, they went and got a coach. And you know, I'll give I'll give Mike credit for realizing that Mike Nolan wasn't good enough. Jim Tom Sula wasn't good enough. You know, they just weren't good enough coaches. They made switches in the secondary and on. So, you know, that that in itself, it, it takes a big person to admit when they're wrong. But you can't also go out and hire your friends and expect that all good things are going to happen. And maybe that was the best example of like, you know what? I learned my lesson. I can't I can't hire my friends and expect this to work. I maybe have to hire people I've never worked with before or I'm not really comfortable working with, but it's going to make our program better. So that I will give him a lot of credit. And again, to my friend overseas who I know will watch this uh, broadcast that you and I are doing right now. There's your apology, sir. <laughs> I think one of the best things about McCarthy this year, and you've made mention of this too, with respect to how he treats his players, the players enjoy playing for him. He takes care of them with respect to their health and mental health yeah. and getting them prepared week in and week out. The other thing I'll say to that is sometimes the best way to do your job is to get out of the way and let yeah. your people do what they do. And I think in a lot of ways, that's, marked how his tenure has gone or his, his season has gone this year, allowing Dan Quinn, Kellett Moore, and yes, John Bones Fossil to be able to be empowered to do their jobs and to do them according to what the vision of this team is relative to Mike McCarthy and what he wants to see on the field and then trusting these coaches to execute it. And for the most part, he's been rewarded by not only his players executing on the field week in and week out for the most part, but the coaches who he's in got in position to run his offense, his defense and special teams. And I think to me, that's an underrated yet overstated part of leadership, I think, is, is that sometimes the best thing to do is just, hey, let your people do what they do and trust them to be able to do the job and see how things go. And then if things do go awry, how do you step in and help your people be able to, you know, get better and improve? I think McCarthy's done a yeah. pretty good job of that. Yeah, no, and I, I don't think you're wrong there. The thing that I would ask of Mike McCarthy is when Kellen Moore was struggling with the offense, mm. you know, I totally understand letting your people do their jobs. Don't micromanage them. Don't look over their shoulder. But maybe this is the time where Kellen Moore needed a little bit of Mike McCarthy in his life. You know, maybe he needed Mike McCarthy to walk into that meeting room when they were all meeting as a staff on the offense and go, have you guys thought about this? Have you thought about this? Let me sit down and watch practice tape with you. Have you thought about this? You know, I, that's where I want Mike McCarthy to step in. Mike McCarthy was a very good play caller with the Green Bay Packers. Towards the end of it, though, him and his quarterback just didn't get along very well. And then, and then you had to split. The team wasn't playing very well. But, you know, it happens. You move on. But Mike McCarthy has been a primary play caller the majority of his NFL career, whether in Kansas City, he was an assistant at the time, but New Orleans, you know, everywhere he's been, he's been a play caller. I need him 
when things aren't going well to step in and help Kellen Moore. Kellen Moore has only been a play caller for three years now. Mm-hmm. You know, Doug Nussmeyer on the staff, been a longtime play caller. Ben McAdoo, who's likely going to get the OC job if Kellen Moore leaves, has been a primary play caller too. I'm just asking that don't keep letting the offense struggle. And last week they were outstanding. You know, say what you want. I mean, they were. Everything clicked. When this team plays at home, it's a lot better team on offense, you know. But I I think that where I want Mike McCarthy to step in is I want him to help Kellen Moore. I want him to help Kellen Moore get past any type of problems that he might have. I'm not so much worried about Dan Quinn. I think Dan Quinn knows what he needs to do. Maybe Kellen Moore not being a veteran OC might use a little help. And that's where I want to see Mike step in. I know I've said it a couple of times, but – that's my that's my challenge to Mike McCarthy in this in this uh, situation. Speaking of those coordinators, Dan Quinn and Kellen Moore, they are on the list. As is, it feels like the rest of the world is on yeah. the list for the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, to be interviewed as potentially becoming their next head coach. There, they have a very interesting list of who they want to interview from Byron Leftwich, who of course used to be a longtime quarterback. That there would be my favorite. I think I think Byron Leftwich will be the favorite there. I really do. And if I could, real quick, KG. I think the reason he'll be the favorite is because Trent Baalke doesn't have any confidence in hiring. He's the general manager in Jacksonville. I don't think he has any confidence in hiring a guy that could be could overshadow him. I mean, he potentially was going to work in a situation uh, you know, with Urban Meyer where he really was just going to be a guy that ran the scouting department. Urban Meyer was going to make the decisions on player personnel and who they wanted and who they didn't want. I can see Trent Baalke right now, and I know Trent Baalke. You know, I know the type of person he is. I could see him hiring a guy, a first-time coordinator. You know, maybe Kellen Moore would get a sniff there. But to me, it seems like that Byron Leftwich would probably, because even his work before Tom Brady was a top five, was a top five offense. And they've got a quarterback there that they have to try and fix and or help, put it that way. And Trent is going to, you know, uh, Byron will probably step back, let Trent do what he wants to do with personnel, and then just coach the team. So I don't see a dominant kind of head coach guy showing up there, maybe a Doug Peters and guys like that. I just don't. You know, I kind of feel like that it's going to be a first-time coach, and they're going to roll with that because that's what the general manager wants. Some of those names that are on that list as well, we talked about Byron Left, which there. Also, you mentioned Doug Peterson. Jim Caldwell is another name. Jim Caldwell. See, those are good names. Doug mm-hmm. Peterson, Jim Caldwell. Jim Caldwell should have never been fired from the Detroit Lions. Agreed. He's a really good coach. Everywhere he's been, Colts, Lions, teams won. You know, his personality is not that of a fiery leader kind of a guy. But, you know, it's neither was Tony Dungy. I'm about to say you know, I mean, the Tony Dungy mold, exactly. Yeah, I mean, there, there's some quiet coaches that do a tremendous job of, you know, not having to be yellow screamer guys. And, like I said, I, I just with that general manager, I don't think he has the guts to hire a veteran coach. Might be wrong about that, you know, but he's going to want some way where he can control the personnel and be able to kind of dictate how his team looks. So to a larger degree now with Kellen Moore and Dan Quinn, how in your situation in years past when you've seen coordinators who have been up for jobs, how yeah. teams handle these kinds of situations because with success comes the idea that, well, these coordinators could be potentially head coaches, specifically to Kellen Moore and Dan Quinn. And I think more Dan Quinn because of how he's already had previous experience as a head coach, been to a Super Bowl, reinvented himself as a coordinator. What do you see on how this Cowboys team will need to handle this based on the fact that both of these guys are going to be mentioned quite a bit when these jobs continue to come open during this offseason? I've already heard Mike McCarthy kind of talk about things about timing and the understanding of that. I, I think there's some concern with Mike McCarthy about these interviews. I, I really do. And my experience is what happens is when you get a coach who is going to interview for a job, he has to prepare for that interview. Sure. You know, all of a sudden it's like you don't want to go in there and not know anything about the Jacksonville Jaguars. You do not want to know any. I mean, the first question, if you're Trent Baalke or the ownership there is like, you know, how can you help my quarterback? What are you going to do to help my quarterback? And, you know, you don't want to go in there blind. And so what happens is when is Dan Quinn and when is Kellen Moore going to prepare for these interviews? 
you know, are they, is it taking time away from their game plan? Are they, are they getting in the office at four in the morning and, and, you know, watching as much Jacksonville Jaguar tape as they can? Are they having the, the video directors make cut-ups so they can watch, you know, every throw that Trevor Lawrence has made? Are there are all blitzes or tackles that Miles Jack has made? You know, that's, that's kind of where, you know, these coaches are. They're trying to prep their interviews and they're also trying to get ready for games here with, you know, that's, I think there's some really con- some, some concern from, from, uh, from Mike McCarthy, because he's like, listen, I, I know these interviews are happening, but please make them where it's on an off day for us, or it's on a weekend for us, you know, don't take him away on a Tuesday, or I guess it's a player day off now, but don't take him away on a Wednesday or a Thursday, mm-hmm. you know, or try and do that. You know, let's make sure the interviews take place and be fair, but there has to be concern. Now, what happens also to KG is you've got young guys on these staffs too. Okay, Dan Quinn gets an opportunity interview. Say he gets the job. What you got these assistants that are kind of like, hey, Dan, if you get the job, can I, you know, can you think about me for a for the uh, linebacker coach job. Can you think about me for the defensive back coach job? Hey, can you think about me for the DC job or the OC job or something, you know? So now all of a sudden you got a bunch of guys kind of walking around the building, not really thinking about the game this week. They're thinking about their next job. They're not thinking the about, effect, okay, it sounds yeah, like. how can I be, how can I go from being quality control coach to coaching the wide receivers for the Jacksonville Jaguars? Or how can I go from being the quality control coach on defense and being the linebackers coach? You know, you're thinking about your next job. So what happens, there's a lot of closed doors. It, it turns into Dan Quinn is in his office and the door's closed. Is Dan Quinn on the is Dan Quinn on the phone trying to get a staff together? Is Dan Quinn, you know, these are the things. What what's taking you away from doing your job here with the Dallas Cowboys? That that is a legitimate concern for anybody. Everybody says, "Oh, we're happy when these guys interview and stuff." They're really not. They're really not. Nobody wants to lose Dan Quinn. Nobody wants to lose Kellen Moore. But nobody wants them to be interviewing during the season. You sure. know, it's just it's not. It's different when it used to be when it was in between playoff games and stuff like that. That's you know that's if you had a week off, great, you were able to do that. But you can't do that anymore because these jobs, if you want these jobs, you have to interview for them. You can't just wait till after the end of the season and say, oh, by the way, here I am. Let's interview. These teams have already moved on in a lot of ways. So, yeah, it, it to be honest with you, KG, it is a big damn distraction within that organization right now what's about to happen. Which is interesting because the NFL opened up the window to where teams without head coaches could begin interviewing candidates as early as December 28th, which was on on Tuesday. So it's interesting now that these coaches have these opportunities to do it relative to the timing, because I thought the timing was curious when the NFL decided to do it. I was like, well, you're going to do this in the middle of the regular season while teams are still preparing. So it's interesting that you would say that, hey, this is not something that's ideal for any not team. Good. Especially no, this a team is not that's, good. Yeah. Uh-uh. There's nothing good. All you ask is, from a general manager standpoint, you ask Dan Quinn and Kellen Moore, please keep me in the loop of what's going on. And that way you can make preparations for, you know, because if you lose guys, you have to be prepared. Now, guys can stay on until the end of the season and then go and that kind of stuff. But the NFL has opened the window to maybe keep to, you know, to get some guys hired before we get to the playoffs, you know, and if it, it turns into that, then – you know, Dan Quinn, if he gets the job, he could say, well, you know, maybe Mike McCarthy says, well, listen, Dan, go ahead and go worry about Jacksonville. We'll, we'll use Joe Witt. We'll use George Edwards. We'll use somebody else or Kellen Moore. You get the job. You know, we'll use Doug Nussmeyer. We'll go use uh, Ben McAdoo. You know, I mean, there's when you leave for a job, it everybody has smiles on their face and, hey, congratulations. And all that. But deep down inside, there is a lot of resentment going on. Because you're thinking, man, you put yourself before us trying to win these playoff games, you know, and but what are you going to do? It's a job. It's one of 32. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can sit there and turn down opportunities. No, you're not going to do that. And, and, you know, for the fans out there that are like, oh, no, they got to stay. They gotta, it's a good deal here. So, no, put yourself in those coaches situations. 
If you were a job, if you're working, you know, you're working a job, you're making $50,000 a year and somebody offers you $150,000 a year to go work, you're picking up and moving. You're not sitting around and thinking like, oh, I have a good situation here at $50,000 a year job. No, you're picking up yourself, your family and whoever else is involved with you and you're going to take that job. That's what you're going to do. So we shouldn't act like these coaches owe us anything Sure. about sticking around just because, you know, we're a fan of the team. If you're thinking that, man, you're never going to get anywhere, you know? I mean, you you, know, you got to pick up and go to, for opportunity, and that's what these coaches do. So I'll ask you this then. Is this a situation where Jerry Jones looks at his staff and says, look, I got a good thing going here. Mike McCarthy, Kellen Moore, Dan Quinn, we've got this team going in the right direction. Do I money whip these guys to yeah. keep them around? especially in the case of a guy in uh, Dan Quinn. I'm like, hey, yeah. do you – because there's no salary cap, quote-unquote, for paying yeah. coaches. You can pay them as much as you want mm -hmm. to. Do you think Jerry Jones would look at his situation and say, hey, maybe I need to pony up and do what I need to do to keep Dan Quinn? Or does he just say, you know what, we'll just take our chances and see what happens? When you, when you, drank, when you drank the wine from that head coaching chalice, you know <laughs> – it, it it's a it's it makes you a different person. It really really does. These guys want to be head coaches. You know they the assistants part of it. Now you get to a point in time in your career where it's like you know what I'm just happy calling ball plays or calling defenses. I, I'm happy doing that. But Dan Quinn's a young guy. You know Kellen Moore really young guy. You know to me if someone tells me hey you could go be a head coach now you you can maybe make a situation where I was part of a deal in with Sean Payton. You know, Sean Payton had an opportunity to interview for the Oakland Raider job when he was here. And I remember Sean going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And finally, it's like, okay, I'm going to interview for this job. And so he's going to go tell Jerry Jones at lunch one day. And so he goes over to Jerry Jones' house, and Jerry Jones then bumps his salary up to, you know, bumps his salary up to seven figures. And so now Sean Payton's like, he tells the Raiders, I think I'm going to hang around here. You know, I think I'm going to stay around. But then all of a sudden, Bill Parcells got mad at, at Jerry and Sean because then all the other coaches were like, whoa, 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 where's, you know, if you're going to bump him up, we do this and we do this and we do this. So then all of a sudden, now you have problems on the coaching staff because everybody's like, wow, okay, well, you think he's worth that? What about me? I'm the linebackers coach. Well, what about me? I'm the D line coach. Well, what about me? I found Micah Parsons. You know that 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 kind of that that's the uh, that's what happens. That that domino effect when you when you say, well, just go money whip somebody. Then you have to think about just what about everybody else's feelings in this whole thing. You know, Dan Quinn brought Joe Witt with him. Uh, he brought uh, you know AD a defensive line coach. Uh, you know he brought. He, you know, he's brought guys along. He's elevated guys. He's demoted guys. I mean, he's he's gone out and scouted. He brought you veteran uh, free agents. You know, I mean, he's been great. But all of a sudden, everybody else kind of looks at themselves and like, man, Dan was good. But what about me? What about me? So that turns into when you start to think about giving people money, then if you give one guy money, do you mean do you give everybody else money, too? because of the job that they were able to do. So it sounds very easy, but in actuality, it's one of those things where you can have some pretty bitter people if you don't take care of them the right way. Interesting to say the least is this will continue to be a developing story as the rest of this regular season go on because Cowboys fans, it's not going to stop. No. <laughs> Kellen Moore and Dan Quinn no. will continue. They're going to get more interviews. They're going to exactly. get more interviews. Yeah. As these yeah. jobs come open. Last thing before we close here, a couple notes. The Cowboys are in their preparations for Arizona. Tyron Smith is going to be practicing on Wednesday on a limited basis as he continues yeah. to work back from his ankle injury. It sounds like things, though, Brian, are trending in the right direction for Tyron to play on Sunday against Arizona. Yeah, I talked to some people over there this morning that were telling me that uh, – yeah, that he is available today to practice, and we talk about it being limited and all that. They're gonna they're gonna see what they got. They're gonna practice him today. They're gonna practice on Thursday, and then Friday they kind of have a, uh, a a place where they they take a break and then practice again on Saturday. So uh, all indications are that Tyron Smith, and again, 
KG, the first time all season. Here we are in week 17. You will have your offensive line together. Smith, Williams, Biotish, Martin, and Collins. Hadn't had that combination all year. Haven't had that combination play all year. And now you do for the week 17. So good for the the Cowboys to uh, have that back. And, you know, let's see. With Tyron Smith, let's hope that that he gets through uh, this, this, you know, what he's dealing with again, uh, you know, it's more, it's a, a, like a reoccurring high ankle sprain is how I was explained to me. And, you know, people have talked about bone spurs and stuff like that, this and that and the other, but it's really more complicated than that from what I was told. And one last note to watch for the Dallas Cowboys down to four linebackers right now, Micah Parsons, Leighton Vander Esch, Keanu Neal and Gifford. Jibril Cox out with a torn ACL. Francis Bernard was placed on the COVID-19 list, and he's got a groin injury that he's dealing with. Mike McCarthy saying, quote, you know, we're definitely looking at guys that may have a prospect here showing up real quick, which is interesting given that going forward. Is that something that Cowboys fans and folks who watch the team need to be slightly concerned about? Is it more so, hey, we've got these four guys. It's really about Parsons and Van Der Esch and Keanu Neal and how they well, move forward. Here. Yeah, in and- – you know, when you look at the situation, you know, those linebackers are the ones that play special teams. Mm-hmm. You know, when you talk about Luke Gifford and and Francis and those guys, I mean, they those were your special teams guys. So, you know, you're down, you're down one of those, one of those. Now maybe you can make it up with some, you know, activate some other guys. Um, it would maybe you also want to think about uh, you know, maybe this is where Dan Quinn or George Edwards or one of the defensive coaches step up and say, listen, there's a guy on the, there's a guy on the Atlanta practice squad that we really like. There's a guy on the Buccaneers practice squad. We really, really like, there's a guy, you know, that instead of bringing somebody in who hasn't been practicing all year as a personnel guy, you try and figure out, okay, can we go poach somebody? Now the Cowboys lost uh, Hamilton, the defensive tackle. He was on the practice squad you know, he was a guy that was kind of a COVID on and off, on and off defensive tackle and didn't play badly. But here he leaves for the Denver Broncos for the opportunity for two games, two game checks, and then more of a full-time position probably next year. So, yeah, you know, the ability to go poach linebackers or poach other players, you know, you go to a team that might have a bad situation, you know, roster-wise, and you say, or, you know, they're not going anywhere, and you say, hey, listen, we'll give you an opportunity to be in the playoffs get a playoff check, maybe even get a shot at the Super Bowl ring if things kind of play out right. So that could be pretty enticing. Uh, if you're a 6 and 10 team trying to do this or whatever, it usually doesn't work out. But if you're a team that's kind of going in a positive direction, maybe you can think about poaching somebody right now. And finally, Dak Prescott named Offensive Player of the Week in the NFC by virtue of his performance going 27 and 35. Was Joe, Burrow the, was Joe Burrow the AFC Player of the Week? Yeah, yeah, definitely the okay. AFC Offensive Player of the Week with his uh, uh, 525 yards yeah. he threw for against uh, the Baltimore Ravens. But uh, right. Dak Prescott. Good for, and great. And see, that's – but, again, look at the numbers. Just if you mm-hmm. want to, go just go to Pro Football Reference and look at Dak Prescott at home and look at him on the road. And maybe it's Kellen Moore. Maybe it's Dak Prescott. Maybe it's the old Jason Garrett. Let's just – Keep it close to the vest. Let's not take many chances and let's punt the football, play defense and hope for a win at the end. You know, maybe because they play a different style of offense. Just look at the numbers. Look at the yards per attempt. Look at the completions home and away. It's a different football player. You should be cheering with all your might, if you're a Cowboy <laughs> fan, that the Minnesota Vikings step up and or the, or the Detroit Lions last game of the year. But you got to take care of business too, and I know on Friday we'll talk about the uh, the uh, Arizona Cardinals because I think there's some things that we that we really need to get into on their team. It, this is not going to be a walk by any means. This is not going to be a walk from from what I've seen watching tape the last couple of days. Will be a fantastic show on Friday as the Cowboys get ready to take on the Arizona Cardinals. You can find Brian on Twitter at Brian Broadus. You can find me on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. Again, be sure to subscribe to 105 Through the Fan here on YouTube and also on 105 Through the Fan on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and 105ThroughTheFan.com. Brian, as always, thank you so much for the time and the perspective. Look forward to talking to you on Friday, and uh, we'll talk to you then. Sounds great, KG. Thank you, man.
Appreciate it.